right, good evening, everyone. It is now six o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the Homeowner Association webinar series hosted by the Regional Stormwater Collaborative of Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky. The Regional Stormwater Collaborative is composed of stormwater districts, municipalities, and soil and water conservation districts in Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky. The purpose of the collaborative is to raise awareness about water quality issues in the Ohio River Valley. So during this evening's webinar, we will be discussing composting and rain barrels. So I do just have a few housekeeping reminders um, before we get started. Um, if you have questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A feature. Um, we will be monitoring those questions and we'll ask those to the presenter at the end, towards the end of the session. Um, we will be picking one door prize winner. Um, you must be present to win. We will call out your name. You have to let us know you're here. And then we will reach out to you with the email, um, email address that you use to log in with this evening. Um, presenter contact information and webinar recordings will be available on the Save Local Waters website one week after the presentation. And uh, the website is Save Local Waters forward slash HOA. Um, so I would like to go ahead and welcome Melissa Profit from Warren Soil and Water Conservation District and Jenny Lohman from the Hamilton County Recycling and Solid Waste District. So Jenny, if you would like to go ahead and begin. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, I work for Hamilton County Recycling Solid Waste District. And uh, our goal is to uh, to uh, prevent items from going into the landfill. So uh, we do have a lot of programs that, that teach people how to do that. And one of them is backyard composting. So uh, we're here, or I'm here tonight uh, to just give you the basics on, on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And... Here we go. So get, get the dirt on backyard composting. Composting is this wonderful soil amendment. Our gardens need this organic matter. And uh, we create an artificial environment so that we actually do not um, get the, uh, the organics that we need in our soil automatically. So that's why we use synthetic fertilizers when we go and buy buy stuff from the, the um, hardware stores. So it can be anything you want it to be, whether you have a vegetable garden or just a flower garden. I, uh, I have both. I, do, I use it um, all over my yard, including my lawn, because it, it does create a valuable soil amendment and it helps my plants grow bigger and stronger. Within Hamilton County, we actually um, could save about 32% of what's going into the landfill if we just backyard compost. So that's about 338 pounds per household per year. And if you think about it, um, there's a difference between backyard composting. You can see the items over here that you can compost in your backyard, but that's not all organic matter. You wouldn't put meat and cheese in there. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but if you do talk about commercial composting that can take more items than we can compost in our backyard. It would be more than half of what we're throwing in the landfill today. And when you backyard compost, you're also reducing the carbon footprint because there's something I learned in science in grade school was the carbon cycle. And when you are adding compost to your garden, you're actually sequestering the carbon um, and creating a, you know, a great environment for your plants to grow. And those microorganisms that we can't even see are just munching away on those things, which allows for more minerals in our vegetables and um, just all kinds of wonderful things that happen in the food web as a result of that organic matter. So it's pretty easy to compost. You just pick a spot and build a pile, provide food, water, and air. The three, the three things that we learn in first grade that all living things need. So when you pick a spot, it just has to be convenient to you. 
it needs to be at least three by three by three. Um, it could be the sun or the shade. It should have good drainage and not be against any tree or wood structures. <laughs> this is the, the generic bin that you can see at the, uh, often at stores. And these are great when you live in an HOA. Um, if your HOA will allow it. And, and, I'm, and, you know, it is sort of like the new black, you know, the dre dress, your little black dress, this is what every yard uh, needs. And when you see those in somebody's yard, you know that those are really on top of it people. So this is a great bin because it has good drainage. It, it is open at the bottom. It does hold the heat in because it's black and most animals cannot get into it. I haven't had any in mind. Uh, it does have access to soil organisms, which is important. It, you will need to add water um, once in a while, especially if you leave the lid on, but it is capacity limited. And I know a lot of people that have one um, like myself, I went ahead and bought a second one this year because one was just not enough. This is sort of the Cadillac of compost bins that you can purchase, a tumbler bin. Um, it's so easy to turn, which is one of the things you wanna to do to aerate your compost. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It does heat up quickly. And I kind of um, think that that is similar to uh, a hanging plant, how you have to add water to that more often. Um, that's what like this tumbler bin because it is off the ground. It does dry out quicker. And because it's not on the ground, it doesn't have access to the, to the soil organisms that, that are actually making the compost. So when you add thing, it, when you add to a tumbler bin, you should always hand like a handful of, of topsoil, not potting soil because that's st sterile, but pot, um, topsoil that has the organisms in it from your yard. Of course, they're probably not gonna allow you to have this in a HOA, but um, if you happen to be watching and you own a lot of property, this is the easiest low cost way uh, to have a, a compost pile. I have something similar list to this that I just store my leaves in um, because that is the carbon that you need to add to your compost throughout the year. So I, this time of year, I have a whole bunch of leaves that I store up that will last me all year long. It is inexpensive. It's good drainage, access to those organisms, and we'll keep some of the animals out. This is a really nice system. You can see that she is actually putting her debris in the first bin. The second bin is actually, she's She's adding her carbons and her nitrogens. We call those the browns and the greens. And step three, this is compost that is seasoning. It's almost ready. So when you start your pile, you just want to start with about, oh, two feet of leaves, some carbon material. And um, again, leaves are plentiful, so that's what I use. And it's always best to shred it if you have that capability. I don't have a shredder, so I don't. Sometimes, you know, I'll mulch mow and then I'll pick up some of those leaves so they're shredded somewhat. Other times I just rake them up and use them whole like that. But I've got oak leaves that do not break down as nicely as like if you have a maple tree, but they do break down still. So you wanna start with your, your carbons on the bottom of your bin and then you can add your nitrogens which are your greens, and those are your food scraps or your green plants, and then you can add your leaves on top of that. So you always want to cover up your, your um, compost with the brown layer on top. So when you provide the food, that's what I, when I was talking about the browns and the greens, that's the carbon and the nitrogen. So you want one part nitrogen, and those are the food scraps, in eggshells, anything from your kitchen that used to be a plant, moldy bread, you know, rice that got, you know, left at the bottom of the fridge and forgotten about, moldy pasta. The carbon rich materials, as I said before, are leaves. You can also use straw or hay or wood chips or sawdust. The denser an item is, the longer it will take to break down. So if you're using wood chips or the twigs that you throw in there, those are gonna take some time to break down. Just like uh, I, my neighbors all throw their pumpkins in my, in my compost pile. 
And in the spring, I'm not going to find anything left of that pumpkin other than the stem and maybe some seeds because those are more dense products. There are items you do not want to add to compost and those include meat and bones, any plant, uh, carnivore or herbivore. Herbivores are fine. So if you have rabbits or chickens, you can add their, their uh, manure, but uh, dogs and cats, no. They have a lot of diseases and they're on a lot of medicines. Um, also weeds with seeds. Sometimes our backyard compost do not get hot enough to actually burn out those, those seeds and you don't want those spread in your yard later on. And then, and then also dairy products. You not, do not want to add dairy products or anything that's really oily. So if you have um, leftover uh, salad that went to waste and it's drenched in, in salad dressing, do not compost that just because the oils um, can smother those microorganisms. So we've covered food, what we feed our compost. Now we wanna provide water. And the water I typically don't need to add. I try to take my black bin lid off if I know it's gonna rain. And also fruits and vegetables are 90 to 90% water. And um, so, so they, add, they add moisture. It's mostly in the summer months when it's really hot and it hasn't rained that I have to provide water. You don't want it too wet. Um, you want it about as uh, the consistency of a wrung out sponge. And air, so providing air. And that means turning your compost. It's easy with this sort of system where you can actually pull the slats off. You can see here how these slats, they actually used to stack up like that. So she can get in there easily and turn it. I, I did not have a pitchfork. I used a spade. Um, and this is convenient if you have the black type of purchased compost bins because um, it's called a wing digger and it basically fluffs it. Since you can't really get the leverage you need with a, with a shovel or a pitchfork in these smaller bins. In the winter time, um, the microorganisms and the little critters like worms and, and millip uh, millipedes and pill bugs, they need um, shelter too. So in the wintertime, we don't turn, we just layer. So we call that a lasagna layer. This is my open bin. And uh, just an example of what I've done here is throwing my food, sc food scraps out on top and then layered it with some leaves. And you know, in this, and when I go in the spring after the thaw, this will disappear. This will no longer, it will actually be turned into compost already. I'll just see my leaves. Um, and again, there might be some fibrous materials in there, for instance, like I said, the, the stem of a pumpkin or the, pit, uh, the outside of an avocado, those break down not as quickly as some things. So how do you know it's working? Well, if it shrinks, it's working. You can buy yourself a, a compost thermometer. I don't believe it's necessary. Um, this is steam coming off the compost. I have only seen that in the springtime when I'm digging into my compost for the first time. And it's, you can see the steam coming out, but I don't have big piles like you see here. Um, you know it's working because after you turn it, the next day when you go out there, it will be smaller. So it will be reduced. So on my, on my black bin, I actually like will have it filled to the top. And then when I go out a couple of days later, it will have shrunk already. So I can continue adding to it, even though I think it's full, it's actually decomposing and, and the materials are getting smaller and smaller. And you know it's ready if it doesn't look like what it used to be. So if you're still seeing twigs and a banana peel, your compost is not ready. So it looks like soil and it smells earthy. It's cool to the touch if it's ready to go. So what I like to do with my compost before I use it is screen it. And when I first started composting, I never did that because I thought I'm just digging holes in the ground and adding it. Why I never have enough to use it as mulch around my garden bed. So, um, but then I thought, you know, I teach this class, I really should try uh, to screen it just to see what it's like. And I've actually really fallen in love with it. 
um, because it makes such a, a beautiful compost. And then you, after you screen it, you can throw those pieces that fall through back into your compost pile. So there are so many uses for compost. Um, as I said before, whenever I dig a hole in my yard, I add compost to it because our soil, as you know, is so uh, clay. And so I always add this organic matter. I actually uh, purchased a soil test kit through uh, Hamilton County Soil Water Conservation District and had my soil tested. They said that I needed to put an inch of compost over my entire lawn because I had no organic matter in my lawn. My uh, soil, in, it's not even soil, it's dirt was impacted. And um, so that is one thing that I've been using my compost for is just throwing it right on top of my grass and it does uh, just soak in very nicely. I can also use it for potted plants. You'd use about one third compost to two thirds potting soil. Use it over your vegetable gardens, mulch in your beds. There's so many different things you can do. Now, there are people will say, you know, my compost isn't working. I find that the, the two things that people, uh, that the two biggest mistakes that people make is that they don't turn it so it doesn't have enough oxygen. Just think about if you were exercising, you would want, um, you know, you know, you're breathing hard, you're sweating, and that's what you're your compost, those microorganisms in your compost are doing, they need that oxygen so they can work hard too. And then the picture of, of uh, the wet cat here. Sometimes if it gets too, too wet, um, it can get stinky, but uh, you just have to add some more dry browns to it. So just throw some dry carbons in there and mix it up and that'll solve that right away. So do-it-yourself compost bins. If uh, your HOA will not allow for backyard compost bins, you could maybe ask them, hey, you know, do you think we could uh, get a piece of land here at the HOA where we can start a community garden and then you can build a compost bin there? This is actually a picture of a bin that was, was built in the city of Wyoming. And it's there, they are using that as a community and Hamilton County Recycling and Solid Waste District has waste innovation grants that are available. Um, the grant cycle has closed out until 2021, but you can see the information on our website. If you're interested, and if you have a waste diversion project, you can put in for a grant to help pay for that project. And we love to see people composting. And community gardens are, are and backyard gardens are really big now as more and more people are growing their own food and preserving. As a matter of fact, my background picture is a salsa that I, that I preserved this, this summer and I had a heck of a time finding the can, canning lids uh, because everyone was canning this summer due to the COVID. So gardening is really kicking off and composting will make your garden healthy and your plants more nutritious and strong. And these are just a variety of different ones that I have found at different stores or online. If you are interested um, and want, need some leaves, the, here are some communities that offer something and all of them are different. Uh, for instance, some of them will deliver to your home. If, if you're in a community, Others will say you can only come and get it if you call us in advance at this address. Um, or some of them will say, yeah, sure, you live in this other community, come and get it. You can have it in, in, until it's gone. And others are, tell us, um, no, it's only for our community members. So there's also a Facebook group, the Greater Cincinnati Leaf Exchange, where you can go there and request leaves or try to um, get rid of maybe some of your leaves. I noticed on next door, one of our neighbors um, said, why did somebody take all those bags of leaves I had set out for the garbage man? And um, other people answered, well, I'm sure they were wanting it for compost. So if, oops, your, your um, HOA will not allow, or if you live in a condo and you're listening, or if you just don't have the strength or the energy or the want to compact your compost, you can actually go to a food scrap drop-off. If you wanna keep your food scraps out of the landfill and organics 
does create methane in the landfill. So these are all the businesses that I know of currently that uh, are in Hamilton County or Northern Kentucky that will either allow you to drop off your food scraps or come and pick them up. And, and of course, they all have a fee for that. Um, and you can find all that information about how to contact these different places and their price points and that sort of thing on our website. And our website is hamiltoncountyrecycles.org. You can sign up for a compost blog. It comes out about every two weeks. It's just a very light, short um, article, different, all things composting. We have a compost blog, I'm sorry, a compost guide that you can download also on our website that will really take you through in more detail what I have just discussed now. If you check back in 2021, we have been having a compost bin sale every year these last few years. And it has, we've sold, I think 800 compost bins last year and 600 the year before. Um, and for Hamilton County residents, it's a wonderful deal because you get about half price of what you would pay at the store. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them at the end um, of Melissa's uh, Rain Barrels uh, talk or you can reach out to me directly via email at jenny.loman at hamiltoncounty.org. And thanks again, appreciate uh, your attendance tonight. And I'll turn it over to you, Melissa. Okay. So if Sarah does not have anything to say here, I just want to introduce myself. Yes, my name is Melissa Prophet, and I am the Education and Communication Specialist for the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. So let me start sharing my screen because today we are going to be talking about rain barrels. Now, I'm always excited to talk about the topic of rain barrels because rain barrels are something that we are seeing more and more often throughout our communities. Um, at residences, even places of businesses, we're seeing rain barrels. And because we're seeing them more often, you know, we're seeing lots of different types and varieties. Um, in the photograph here, you see this is a type of a rain barrel called a rain station rain barrel, and it has a planter on the top there. And you can find rain barrels in lots of different colors, styles, and it's exciting to see because rain barrels are really important for our environment. And they provide a lot of critical benefits to us living in our communities as well. So when we think about, okay, well, what is a rain barrel? A rain barrel collects and holds rainwater, which we can use for later use, such in landscaping and even outdoor cleaning. Um, rain barrels, you can have a single rain barrel, or you can even have multiple rain barrels linked together to increase how much rainwater you we can collect. Now, when we think about, okay, well, what's the good side of the rain barrels, right? What are the benefits that we get from them? Well, rain barrels are collecting rainwater runoff. When we think about how often we get rain events, especially here in Southwest Ohio, Every time the rain comes down, well, once that rain lands, it has to go somewhere. And in our communities, we're increasingly seeing surfaces that are impermeable or cannot soak in rainwater the way that soil or an open field can. When we think about all of the different roads, parking lots, even the roofs of our homes and buildings, this is causing an increase in the water that is then running across the surface of the land. And what happens is we get things like drainage problems and drainage issues because of this increased amount and increased speed of the water. We also get erosion issues where we can see the water carrying the soil away. So these are problems that can occur on our properties. We can see increased flooding and damages that that water can cause. The other thing that rainwater will carry with it is pollution. So when we think about pollution, we can kind of think of it in two different categories. We can think of it as point source pollution, which means we can pinpoint where the pollution is coming from, 
or we have what's called non-point source pollution. And that's the pollution that all of us make on a daily basis, right? We can't exactly pinpoint where it's coming from, but it has a, cu a cumulative effect on the environment. And this pollution is carried by the rainwater. So common examples of this non-point source pollution are is that sediment, right? The soil that gets carried away with the erosion, but it can also pick up things like heavy metals, any pesticides that we are applying to the property, fertilizers on the property. With fertilizers washing into the water, we get nutrient pollution, which can cause algae spikes. If you guys are familiar at all with what's going on in Northern Ohio with the Great Lakes, you know, this is a ongoing issue that that's being addressed and the stormwater runoff and these pollutants can contribute to those problems. We also have things like our automotive fluids, household chemicals, even pet waste. You know, when we're walking our dogs in the neighborhood with that waste isn't picked up, the rainwater will come down, it carries it into the storm drains that we have along our streets, out into our waterway systems. This increases things like E. coli, bacteria. So not good for, you know, for us living in the, in the community. So rain barrels help to reduce this problem by reducing the amount of stormwater runoff we have that is carrying these pollutants into the waterways. Rain barrels also help to save money. And that's always a good thing. When we think about conserving water and saving money, well, residential watering, when we're watering our lawns, our flowers, our gardens, it can it contributes to 40% of domestic water consumption on our municipality water system. Um, especially when you think about the increased temperatures of the summer months when we are consuming a lot more water and using more water. When we have rain barrels that have collected the rainwater for us, we now have another reservoir of water that we can use to take the stress and the pressure off of the municipal water system and then it saves our watering bill as well. So what can we do with all this rainwater that we're storing? Well the rainwater we can use for watering the lawn, watering plants. You can use it for washing your car outside, window cleaning, I've even heard of people who say they wash their hair in their rain barrel water um, because it makes it softer. Now that's not something that I have done, but people are, are, you know, they're creative in the way that they're utilizing this water. And what you do have to remember though, is that it is rain barrel water coming off of our roofs and our gutters. And so therefore it's not to be consumed, right? We do not want to drink the water. It's not potable, but it can be used for a lot of other things that we then aren't using again that municipal water system for. So how much water can we collect in these rain barrels? So I'm gonna kind of give you guys a little bit of math. Don't worry, we can make these, um, all of these slides and information that you're hearing tonight, we can make available to you if you're interested. So do not feel like you have to try to write down all of these uh, mathematical equations. But it is, I think, really beneficial to see, you know, what those numbers look like. So here's an example of if you've got a roof area of 1,000 square feet, which would be 25 by 40 feet, and we get an inch of rain, well, that equals about 600 gallons of water. So your rain barrel, when you think about, okay, well, what size rain barrel might I need? Because they do come in a variety of sizes, 45 gallons, 60 gallons, just depends. But your rain barrel volume can be determined through this great equation um, that has been derived. And what it looks at is, okay, that surface area of your roof in square feet, the rainfall, and then it also takes into consideration a loss to the system. Because we are gonna have a little bit of loss either through evaporation, through little cracks you know, in a gutter or a downspout, you're gonna have a little bit of loss. So it takes into consideration that. And then we are converting gallons, right, per cubic feet. So we've got a conversion factor there. So if we had one 60 gallon rain barrel, that would provide runoff storage for a rooftop area of around 215 square feet when we plug in those variables into this equation. So 
okay, we know that rain barrels can do a lot of good for the environment. Uh, we've looked at how much water we can actually collect with the rain barrel, but where do we wanna put the rain barrel on our property? Well, when we think about choosing a location, you want to install your barrel on a sturdy raised surface. Um, you know, concrete blocks work well or some kind of a, you know, a lifted area. Um, biggest boost to the environment is find a downspout that drains to an impervious surface. Remember that those sidewalks, driveways, concrete that won't soak in the water. Um, and then that way we are reducing the amount of water that's running along those impervious surfaces down into our gutters, into our storm drains. We also wanna consider safety. So mosquitoes are often, you know, a concern whenever we have any type potential standing water. Now with rain barrels, you're gonna have a lid and what you wanna watch for is not having any pooling at the top of the barrel. Now, most of the barrels are designed to prevent that. They either have a little bit of concaveness that will run that water out, or they will have little, little holes that will allow the water to drain off if it was raining on top of the barrel. So this prevents mosquitoes from being an issue. And then you wanna make sure that no drainage or the overflow from the barrel is going onto the house foundation. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different types and controlling where that overflow is occurring. Now, rain barrels can get very heavy. A full rain barrel can weigh over 400 pounds. So just like anything heavy that might be on our property, we just wanna make sure that it is secured. So you can, actually secure your barrel with a bungee, um, tie it up to make sure that it is nice and secure, and also just make sure that you don't have kids or pets that would be climbing on it. Once we have our rain barrels in place, we do have a little bit of maintenance to do, but it's actually not a lot. Maintenance requirements for rain barrels is really about just maintaining the different parts of your system. So when we think about the rain barrel, well, we're having to connect it then to our downspout in order to catch the rain flow coming off of the roof. So in this picture, you can see a couple of different pieces that go with a diverter kit in order to connect your rain barrel to that downspout. With maintenance, we have to look at the whole system. So first of all, the roof, right, where the water is landing. We want to make sure that we don't have a lot of debris and, and particulate matter on our roof, because anything on our roof has the potential to be carried by the water into our gutter system. The gutter is the next place then we want to make sure that we don't have obstructions or leaks. Installing a rain barrel is a great incentive to really keep your gutters clean. If any of you are like myself, that's not always my favorite uh, house chore to do, but since installing our rain barrels, it's kind of an extra benefit of I need to keep these gutters clean and it's a little bit more motivation for myself to do that. Um, I also, you wanna check your downspouts, make sure that you don't have leaks or obstructions occurring. You can also check the entrance to your rain barrel to ensure that you're not having any leaks um, and that your seals are in good repair and in good condition. Um, for the different parts that you will see in a diverter kit that will come with your rain barrel if you choose to purchase one, you know, those all those parts can be replaced as well. Runoff in your overflow pipe on your rain barrel, you wanna check that um, you know, that everything is intact there. And your rain barrel, okay, you can choose to have a spigot attached to it to that you can fill your watering cans, hook a hose up to it. So you just always wanna check the seals on that as well. And then if you have any accessories such as linking multiple barrels together, you would wanna check those connection sites. So really it's just about keeping an eye on how the rain barrel and all of its parts are coming along. In the winter time, right? So right now, this is the time that we would actually be um, kind of putting our, our barrels to rest, if you will, for the winter and winterizing them. Um, you can disconnect your rain barrel from your downspout um, with several different styles, such as the rain station rain barrel, which I had the picture of at the beginning. It will come with a 
piece that will kind of insert into the hole where it was disconnected from your downspout. Um, and that way it keeps the integrity of your downspout and it controls where the water is still going down the downspout. You also wanna to check to make sure that the flow from the end of the downspout is directed away from your home and won't cause erosion. Now, where the water is directed from the downspout and overflowing from the barrel is also something that you wanna take into consideration if you're installing rain barrels, dependent upon where you live. So I like to kind of interject here that depending upon what municipality you live in, there could be different ordinances pertaining to rainwater collection and rain barrel use. And a lot of that is tied into, well, where is the water going? Um, some municipalities might have a directive where your downspouts have to be tied into a sewer system. So you can't disconnect the downspout to have, say, an open flow rain barrel where the water is just going straight in. You might need a certain type of rain barrel that you are directly connecting into your downspout so that overflow is still going down the downspout and it's being directed where the city needs it to go. So always check with your local municipality first whenever installing something like this. Um, for instance, the city of Cincinnati, rain barrels actually were not allowed in Cincinnati until 2013. So now they are allowed, but there are specifics about where the overflow needs to go and how you connect it to your downspout. So the good news is, is that because we have a variety of rain barrels that you can choose from, you should be able to find a rain barrel to fit those conditions and be able to still utilize this awesome conservation practice. So rain barrels, there are several options available to purchase commercially, um, but you can also build your own rain barrel. Um, several soil and water conservation district offices, including Warren County, where I work, we will host rain barrel workshops where you actually come and you will learn about rain barrels and then build rain barrels. So you can see you can, from the slide here, there are different um, containers that you could choose. And then the way that it connects to the downspout with the diverter kit pictured on the slide on the other side. Hosting a rain barrel workshop can be a great community builder as well. Um, homeowners associations, I know that often you're building your communities or you're looking for residents to volunteer in the community and hosting a workshop for your HOA is a great way to build that community. And also you can look at, well, what style of rain barrel works best? You know, what kind of aesthetic do we want for the rain barrel on the property in our community? Um, and you can then make sure that that is kind of a consistent message in your community. Butler County SWCD has a great video on building your own rain barrel. Um, in the, just the essence of time, I won't show it here, but you can see this on the Butler County SWCD YouTube page. Um, and it's a great walkthrough about how how simple it really is to build these barrels. Um, and again, you can reach out to your local soil and water conservation district, depending upon what county your community is located in, about guidance or even the possibility of a workshop at some point as well. Now with rain barrels, you know, we've looked at the different containers and you can really make these beautiful pieces of art as well by just simply adding just a little bit of color. So when we think about rain barrels, right, you can prep your barrel, you wanna clean it, you wanna sand it, and then you wanna prime it. Um, that's gonna give you a nice surface to then add whatever kind of artistic flair you would like to your barrel. With design layouts, you can stencil or you can freehand. Um, a lot of artists will choose to kind of just use a pencil to get your design on there and then you can start to paint your barrel. When you wanna do a paint selection, again, remember your barrels are outside. So you wanna look for an outdoor acrylic or an outdoor spray paint. You can see in the picture here that this person is actually using a real leaf branch there as their stencil. So you can bring nature if you want or any kind of theme or aesthetic 
to the barrels. Once you finish, you want to put on a coat of polyurethane to protect it from the elements. And then you've got a beautiful art piece that complements your landscape and is providing all of these great conservation benefits to the environment and to your community. For those of you who maybe aren't as artistically inclined, this would include myself, um, there is a great project that Save Local Waters participates in every year, the Rain Barrel Art Project. This is done in partnership with the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, this year, we've just opened up for artist submissions for the different barrels that will be auctioned off. And the auction will occur in April of 2021 for those interested in maybe purchasing a already painted beautiful rain barrel. Um, for more information, you can go to savelocalwaters.org um, forward slash 2020 project to get more information about the rain barrel art project. So here is my contact information. Um, you know, in HOAs, in the community where you live, rain barrels really are a great backyard conservation practice that can be utilized in a way that is, you know, is beneficial for us because we can save money. It's beneficial for our communities because it's helping to take some of that pollution out of our waterways. Um, and it can be a great connection in the community that you're living as well. So again, thank you for your time and I can answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, thank you very much, Melissa and Jenny. Um, so just a reminder, um, if you have any questions for Melissa and Jenny, um, you can put those in the question and answer section um, and we will um, answer those live. Um, but while we're waiting for people to enter those questions, um, we do have a door prize winner. Um, so Terry, if you are still here, please raise your hand or put it, say I'm here in the question and answer section. Um, and then we will be in touch. So Terry, if you're here, just let us know. Okay, we do have a question. Um, is showering, showering, sorry, with rain barrel water considered consumption? Well, so I guess it depends on if you're in the shower, is water getting into your mouth while you're in the shower at all? You know, I don't know that I would personally recommend showering in rain barrel water, depending upon where that water is running off of. You know, when it's coming off of, say, your roof, you know, you don't know what kind of maybe particulates or even fecal matter might be on there. So it, I would say take that, you know what I mean, with a grain of salt, um, just because the water is going to be carrying with it anything that was on the surface that that water is then running over. Hey, uh, Sarah, this is John here. I had a question for Jenny. Yeah. Jenny, what, at what point in the spring do you first, you know, disturb the compost? I, I go out and look at it and typically I'll, I'll try to pull off the top and, and then if I see that it's still frozen underneath that, I'll just give it another week. So it's not, I would say typically end of March, sometime in April is when I start working it again. And I can typically get finished compost. And um, especially when we have mild winters, it does compost all year round down inside so you'll get compost at the very bottom bottom of your pile. It, but it, most of your work is done spring, summer, and um, that's when you, you can get composted. Typically they say it takes uh, four, four months. It take, in the summertime, I can get compost in like six weeks because I like to work my compost. Thank you, Jane. Jenny, this is John again here as people might be typing the question. So I have a walnut tree, black walnut tree in my backyard that drops a ton of black walnuts. And so when I am occasionally pulling leaves to compost, I throw in the occasional black, black walnut. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, black walnuts uh, are toxins to other plants. And I don't think it would be bad to have a few leaves, but um, in general, 
you really don't, that's the one of the only leaves you do not want to use uh, when you're composting uh, because you don't want to provide toxins. But I have had people tell me, well, certain plants grow very well under black walnut trees. I'm not that um, in tune to it because I, I haven't experienced black walnut. But all, that's a, I, I'm glad you brought that up because another thing that, that you can use um, in your compost is your wood ash. So if you have a, a wood fireplace um, or a fire pit at home, uh, you can actually throw in the wood ash um, into your compost and that's a real nice base and that balances out my acidic oak leaves very nicely. Um, however, you do never want to use charcoal briquettes because they are a petroleum based product. Thank you, Jenny. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in for Jenny or Melissa. Um, so ladies, I would like to thank you guys um, for presenting to us. Um, and I would like to thank everybody that has attended. Um, so our next webinar um, will be on December 1st and we will be um, covering solo, solar and geothermal energy. Now there is still plenty of time for you to register for that. Um, go to savelocalwaters.org or slash HOA and you can register for that one. That is the third webinar in our series. And um, the fourth one is on December 8th and we will talk about um, rain gardens and sustainable landscaping. Um, so I hope everybody has a great evening and you can all join us again on December 1st. Thanks so much for, for inviting me and I enjoyed myself and I enjoyed listening to your presentation, Melissa. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, You're thank welcome. you. Same to you, Jenny. All right. Take care. Good night, everybody. Good night.